Hello, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church, located here in Fayetteville, Tennessee, and we're glad to have you with us today for this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I do want to apologize for our audio difficulties last week. I found out the problem was my iPhone had finally gone as far <laughs> as it could go and I went out and got a new one this week. And uh, so hopefully this is going to sound as it should and maybe even sound a little bit better or look a little bit better <laughs> than in the past. But uh, we're delighted to have you with us today. I do want you to know we will not have a video next week. Uh, we are going to Disney World over spring break. And so we'll be out of pocket, but we'll be back uh, of course, the Sunday after that with a new sermon for you. You know, as we get ready to think about our lesson for today and our uh, scripture, I was reminded of a statement that Abraham Lincoln made. He said, die when I may, let it be said that I planted a flower and plucked a weed anywhere I thought a flower would grow. Lincoln was making a statement in his folksy way that we need to be of use. We need to make a difference in the life of our families and in our community, our nation, and we need to be of use to other people and especially of use to God our maker. Jesus tells us a story about usefulness or a lack of usefulness when he tells us the story of the fig tree in Luke chapter 13 verses 6 through 9. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline its hearing to our hearts and lives this day. Usefulness. The question before us today is, how useful is a fig tree that doesn't bear figs? I have to admit that I don't know a great deal about fig trees or figs. My experience with figs is basically limited to fig newtons that I'm sure all of us have eaten from time to time. I did do some research and found out that the main place that figs are grown in the United States is in California. And the main place figs are grown in the world by far is in Turkey. But figs are also grown in the Holy Land, even today, as it was in Bible times. And so this is something the hearers, those in the audience, would have been familiar with. While we may not know much about figs, we are pretty familiar with apple trees or peach trees, pear trees. I remember growing up as a child, we had some of those trees in our yard, and it was always amazing how much fruit they could produce and just how good it tasted to go out and get a fresh apple right off the tree. Well, a fruit tree is designed for one purpose, isn't it? It's designed to bear fruit. And so it is with the fig tree. The reason it's planted, the reason it's cultivated, the reason that it's cared for is so that it will produce figs that the person can either eat or sell to other people. You don't hear of fig trees uh, being used for making furniture, to build houses. Never heard of anybody saying that they were good stove wood on a cold night. 
We don't use fig trees for that purpose, do we? We've never heard, or at least I haven't ever heard anyone say, you know, it was so good to sit under the shade of the big fig tree. Just like we might say that about a sugar maple or a white oak. The fig tree is there for one reason. It is to produce fruit. And if it is not producing fruit, then it's not of much use to the owner of the orchard or to the gardener or to anybody else. It's just taking up space. It is taking in, but not giving out. It's taking in sunlight, it's taking up water through the roots, it's taking in nutrients from the soil, but it's not producing anything. Now, sometimes we encounter people such as this, and we need to be sure we are not one of them ourselves. I remember a friend of mine in college, uh, that's been more years than I would like to think ago, we'll say about 20 or 25 years ago, made the statement to me once that she had determined there were two types of people in the world. There were givers and there were takers. And she unapologetically said she was in fact a taker. As I observed her life through the years, I can see what she meant. She seemed to be much more concerned about what people could do for her and helping her advance her self-interest than in her trying to help and assist other people. In some ways, maybe that did work to her benefit, but in the end, it has really damaged her relationships with other people. Because when someone is just constantly taking and not giving, it is very hard for the relationship to be healthy. So is it with our own life. While on one hand, it might seem that we ought to be all out for ourselves and get all we can and take all we can, we have to remember that by giving, we not only help others, but we are enriched at ourselves and feel better about ourselves. God has put us here for a purpose, and that purpose is to first and foremost, serve him and do his work and will, and also to help one another and to help especially those that are in need and to try to make the world and life a little better place, not just for us or our own family, but for humanity. In this story, we read about a fruit tree that is not producing any fruit, and the owner of the vineyard is upset about it. Apparently, this fig tree should have produced fruit for three years, and it is still not produced the first fig. The owner tells the gardener, just cut it down. It's wasting space. It's taking water away from the other trees. It's wasting the nutrients in the soil. It may be competing with the other trees and limiting uh, the fruit they can produce. So just cut it down and be done with it. Well, the gardener doesn't want to do that, does he? The gardener pleads with the owner to give the tree one more chance, to give it another year, and then we'll see if it can produce fruit. The owner is frustrated, and I think we understand why. He's already invested in this tree and has put in several years waiting for it to produce fruit. I know I planted an apple tree and a pear tree a few years ago, and uh, I'm still waiting for them to produce fruit because it just takes time from when you plant them until they get old enough to bear. In this case, they waited until they were old enough to bear the fruit, and then seemingly an additional three years, and still no figs. So he says, let's just cut it down and start over again, be done with this thing but we see the patience of the gardener. He says, give it another year. Let me care for it. Let me fertilize it. Let me water it. Let me, you know, baby it along and see if we cannot get it to produce some fruit. It reminds me much of our relationship with God. God looked down from heaven and saw a 
human race that was failing. We weren't bearing much fruit of goodness. Sin was running rampant and evil was at hand. And we know that in that setting, God decided out of his love, his patience, to send Jesus Christ to this world so that we might have new life. It is through Christ, symbolized by the gardener in this story, that we get a new opportunity, a new opportunity to be of service to the Lord. You know, God is patient. He is long-suffering. Even when we disappoint him time after time after time, he continues to plead with us and give us a new chance, a second chance to serve him. You know, God tried uh, starting all over again with the flood, didn't he? He was hopeful that Noah's descendants might tell a different story. But we can look around our world today and realize that there is still much evil and sin and brokenness in our age. And so we know that through Christ, God planned to bring everything into line again and to renew the creation and to renew our hearts and to renew our lives. And God is patient. He gives us many opportunities. He may knock on our door 10 times, 20 times, two times, but he gives us opportunity and chance after chance. The Bible is filled with such stories. We are in Lent now, and it won't be long until we will be gathered for our Monday Thursday service. And various scripture texts will be read. One of those will deal with the story of Peter. Peter, on the night Jesus would be betrayed, promised Jesus that he would go with him all the way to the end. And even when Jesus told him that there was great danger, Peter said, don't worry, I'll be here. I will die with you. Yet we know when Jesus was shackled by the temple guards that Peter drifted into the crowd. And when he was later identified by some there and accused of being a follower of Jesus, he emphatically denied this. He even cursed Jesus said that he had never known the man. Yet, Jesus gave him another chance, didn't he? That was not the end of Peter. If it had been, we would read very little about him in Scripture. But instead, we know that Jesus had already promised that Peter was the rock on which he would build his church. That had not changed even though Peter had disappointed the Lord and even though he had missed an opportunity to be of help. We know that when Jesus rose from the dead on the first day, when he appeared to the women, he told them specifically this, go and tell my disciples and Peter that I have raised and will meet them in Galilee. He wanted to be sure Peter knew that he still loved him. He still wanted him. He still had need for him. And it is the same with us. We know the Apostle Paul in Scripture, the greatest evangelist in the history of the world. Yet that's not how he began. He began as Saul of Tarsus great persecutor of the church. And even 2,000 years later, I doubt we could find anyone as zealous in his persecution of the church. Yet God gave him another opportunity, didn't he? And gave him the chance to be of service to him. See, Jesus knocks on our heart many times. We get second chances, third chances, fifth and sixth chances often, we get those opportunities of Jesus calling us and desiring us to serve him and to follow him. But sadly, we do not always respond to them, do we? 
We don't. You know, when we look at this story of the fig tree, we see the patience of God. We see the forgiveness. We see how God is willing to wrestle with us and send his spirit to convict us and try to call us home. And we see the mercy and grace of God. But there is something here that must not be missed. This fig tree is not given an unlimited amount of chances. It is granted one more year. Now, some might say, well, hey, even if it hasn't done it next year, the gardener will argue to give it another chance, and that may well be. But all we know in this story is that the gardener pleads for one last chance. The owner grants it. And the gardener says, if it doesn't work this time, we'll cut it down. The gardener pled for one more chance. And Jesus often pleads for us to have one more chance. But here's the thing about that one more chance. We never know when we are at that last chance. We may have a hundred opportunities to come to know the Lord to be baptized and become a believer. We may have a hundred opportunities to be of service to God, but one of these days, possibly even today, at some point we're going to come to the last chance. And it is probably not going to be announced to us to say, hey, now this is the last chance. Because the last chance may come unexpectedly because life is unexpected. And we never know what is going to happen. But we must always be prepared to leave this world. We must always be prepared to stand before God. Because the Bible tells us that on the last day there will be a judgment. That both the living and the dead will be judged. All will stand before God and give account. We must be prepared. We must be sure that our hearts are right with God, that we have made peace through Jesus Christ because we never know when our last opportunity may come. Maybe today, maybe 20 years from now, we just never know, and so we should never delay. But I've seen that a lot, and I'm sure you have too, and maybe you're watching today and thinking, Hey, you know, I'm not really wanting to get hooked up with Jesus right now. I mean, I'll do that later on. I'll do that when I get old. I'll do that when I start having some health problems and the doctors tell me maybe I don't have much time left. Right now, I want to have fun and I want to live it up and I don't want to have to worry with coming to church on Sundays and, and, and giving time to the Lord. I want to do my own thing. I think at certain points in our life, all of us, have, or almost all of us, have probably had thoughts such as that. It's not a very good thought, though, is it? It's not very respectful toward Jesus or the Lord to say, hey, God, I know you're real, and I know one day I'm going to have to get right, but hey, I, I'm going to wait to the last minute, and I'm going to have as much fun as I can we call fun. I'm going to do everything you don't want me to do up until the very last, and then I want to just slide into heaven just like sliding into third base. Well, it doesn't always work that way. I remember as a child growing up here, heard a lot of the old-time preachers preach and tell about how you needed to get right tonight. You needed to get right right now. That This might be the last opportunity. Oh, the many times I've heard it, and probably you have too. There's truth to it, no doubt. And often they would then go on to tell a sad story, a story about someone they or maybe a preacher friend of theirs had known that kept saying they were going to start to church or kept saying they were one day going to make a profession of faith and be baptized, but they never got around to it. And death called, and they never were seemingly able to get things right with God. I used to hear those stories. They're unsettling. 
They're concerning. They're a little scary, aren't they? That we might could actually wait until it was too late. But I often discounted them, thinking maybe they were exaggerations or embellished a little bit or maybe some truth there, but a little added and a little taken away conveniently. But I want to share with you a story that I experienced firsthand here some years ago. This is not embellished or manipulated in any way, just the straight of what happened. One Thursday, about 10 o'clock in the morning, I got a call here from our local care center. There was a man there who was advanced in age and they did not believe he had very long left to live and he desired to be baptized. I got called because with him being in the physical condition he was in, it would be a lot more convenient for him to be poured than to be immersed. And so with that in mind, they called. I got off the phone. I picked up the phone. I called right back to talk to the head nurse there who happened to go to our church to ask her a little information about it. And I said, uh, well, I'll be out there in a few minutes. I said, but now I need to run home. I said, you know, I'm not wearing a suit. I need to go home and get changed in a suit. Then I'll come on out there and do it. She said, I don't think you probably ought to do that. I said, I don't believe he's got very much time and I don't believe he or the family is going to care what you're wearing. So I got off the phone, picked it up, called my father who lives about two blocks from my office He's also a Cumberland Presbyterian minister. I said, hey, I'm going out to the nursing home to baptize somebody. I'm going to swing by and pick you up because we're encouraged to have an elder or another presbyter or another minister with us when we're going to do something such as that outside of the church. I got up from my desk, grabbed my book of prayer. I grabbed our portable baptistry, jumped in the car, went by, picked up my father, who's two blocks away. We drove out to the care center, which is about three miles from here. And all in all, from beginning to end, it might have taken 20 minutes. 20 minutes. That's nothing. You can't even hardly eat lunch in 20 minutes. But it was too late. He had already gone from this world. Now, I trust that we serve a merciful God. And I am hopeful that he was able to make peace with his creator in those final moments. But I wasn't able to talk to him. He wasn't able to receive a sacrament. He wasn't able to be baptized. He wasn't able to be told of the gospel and to us to pray with him because he was gone. Too late. One day for all of us that last chance comes and we have to be very careful that we don't wait too long and in the process miss out on it all. Instead, let us bear fruit for the Lord. Let us be that fruit tree, not that they're talking about or debating whether they're going to cut it down, but be the prize fruit tree, the one that produces the most and the most delicious fruit, the one that the owner and the gardener are proud of. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we do thank you again for allowing us to be here together. We pray that your Holy Spirit will go out with this video. May it speak to each person's individual situation. May it encourage us to do more for you and others and to be more committed to the cause of Christ. We ask that you would forgive our sins and that you would be with us as we strive to serve you. May you bless each person. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Once again, it's been wonderful to have you with us today, and I'm Tim Smith, the pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church here in Fayetteville, Tennessee. We're located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway, about a mile north of the square on 431. We'd love to have you come and worship with us. We have our traditional service at 1030 each morning, each Sunday morning here in the sanctuary. And at 830, we have our little bit more contemporary, a little bit more casual service in the Fellowship Hall. May God bless each and every one of you, and may you have a wonderful, 